Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we're excited to get this started. Um, this is our fourth community discussion series and we're gonna focus on alternative inputs. Um, our first three were on audio cues, uh, haptic feedback uh, and closed captioning and some of the best practices for how we can weave those things into an accessibility conversation to benefit those uh, in the disabled communities and access more immersive tech. Uh, so we're excited to focus on alternative inputs today. And we're joined by uh, Mar Gonzalez Franco, Rick Tett, and uh, Jamie Knight to talk on those uh, uh, alternative input topics. And they each have a wealth of experience and knowledge in the area. And uh, we're really excited to hear from each of them. So our kind of game plan for today is we're gonna um, have 10 short minute presentations or 10 minute short presentations, uh, and, then, and then follow it up with an hour of kind of our community discussion. And hopefully we can stir up some questions that uh, everybody can uh, ask uh, in the hour that follows the presentations um, and really sort of uh, understand more about what Alternative Inputs is all about. Um, I uh, also should start by saying too, my name is Pierce Clark. I work for the XR Association as the senior manager and we uh, handle accessibility, uh, VR and healthcare education. We also work on international standards uh, and our larger health and inclusion portfolio where we deal with privacy and uh, I, um, XR and youth and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, we're, uh, Dylan and I uh, with XR Access kind of partnered together to make these series of community discussions happen. And I'll pass it over to Dylan next. All right, thanks Pierce. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Dylan Fox. I'm the Director of Operations for XR Access. Uh, we're a research initiative at Cornell uh, focused on making virtual augmented mixed reality accessible to everybody. Um, I'm really happy to, to have everybody here for this community discussion because I think something we've realized uh, as we work towards XR accessibility is that nobody has all of the answers yet. Um, the, the information we need to make this, this technology accessible uh, is really split across so many different people uh, and so many different fields, um, both in academia and in industry, uh, in disabled communities, advocacy communities, um, really just all over the place. Uh, and so these community discussions uh, well, we do start them off with some featured speakers just to get the ideas flowing. Uh, we really do want to hear from all of you because you each have a piece of the puzzle that we're going to need to make this technology the best and the, the most equitable and accessible it can be. Um, one last thing I'll say before we get started properly uh, is our XR Access Symposium uh, is going to be in a mere two weeks from now on June 6th and 7th. Um, this is our biggest conference of the year. Uh, you can join both in person in New York uh, or online on Zoom. Um, and we have some absolutely spectacular uh, presentations, breakout sessions, demos, posters, uh, everything you can want lined up. Um, so I just put the link in the chat. Uh, I would definitely encourage anybody here who's interested to check that out uh, and, and to join us. Um, also say that uh, if case uh, anybody who is not able to join us today, this will be posted to our XR Access YouTube uh, soon after we're done here today. So. Um, Please do make sure you, uh, you take note of that. And um, yeah, without any further ado, uh, we'll lead off with Jamie. Uh, Jamie, take it away. Oh, hello. Would you like me to dive into the talk or do a quick intro? Um... If you want to do just a, a quick intro of yourself and then, yeah, go ahead and, and uh, give the talk. You've got uh, 10 minutes on the clock. Okay, 10 minutes on the clock. Uh, I need like one of those, like, it's the final countdown. Okay, well, my introduction I have carefully hidden inside my slides because my first, oh, I should slide, I should share my slides first. That would help, wouldn't it? Da -da 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 -da. There we go. Hopefully, you can all see that. Looking good? Yep. Sweet. Sweet. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie. Hi. Uh, this is Lion. He's a four foot plush lion who goes everywhere with me. And we like being helpful in making things. And we've been doing that for quite a long time. Uh, all sorts of types of helpful, but generally around digital accessibility and a little bit of financial crime fighting, that sort of thing. Uh, our claim to fame or the kind of the little tease that we put here is that millions of people use the things we make every day um, from what we've done over our career, which is kind of cool. But that's enough about me. Uh, I don't need to talk about me. Today, I want to talk to you about adaptive input. So this is like adaptive input story time. I want to tell you what my involvement with it has been. 
uh, give some lenses about where that comes from, um, and then just generally bounce on uh, and then uh, talk about some of the uh, adaptive VR stuff in my life. Uh, right. So, as I said, I started off with the BBC. I spent 11 years with the BBC. And whilst I was there, I worked on our VR barriers research. And interestingly, some sort of people say to me, don't you mean VR accessibility research? And I'd be like, no, 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 no. That's not what we did. We did barriers research. So here's the basic idea, that we experience disability when there's a mismatch between our impairment and our environment. So, for example, my impairments are the factual measurable things about my body. So I'm autistic and fairly wobbly. Um, so that's kind of crossroads, kind of reach things. Um, and the environment is all the built stuff around us. It's the built environment. It's the social stuff. It's expectations. It's, it's all of these things. When there's a mismatch between those two things, it leads to a dis dis disabling experience. So this is known as the social model of disability. It's the mismatch between a person and the environment that creates disability, and that comes in the form of barriers. So to give an example, um, my parents don't disable me, the, the barriers do. I've got a four foot lion who lives with me. If he woke up one morning, nibbled my legs off, and I went to make my very British cup of tea in the morning that I absolutely drink every day, bless the queen, um, then uh, if he'd nibbled my legs off and I couldn't reach the kitchen counter, then I can't reach the kitchen counter, it's too high, right? But equally, if Lion got up in the middle of the night, got out some really big nails and just moved my entire kitchen three feet higher, I'd get up in the morning, go to make my cup of tea, and I still can't reach the counter. It's that mismatch between a person and their environment that ultimately disables people. With VR, we have the creation of a new environment and with it, the creation of new barriers. It's a huge opportunity to do great things, but it's also a huge opportunity to screw it up by just repeating the same barriers we already have in the real world. So one of the questions that I quite often get asked is, well, where do barriers come from? Well, generally speaking, the barriers are the middle of a process. If the barriers remain, they tend to lead to exclusion. Um, so when we get rid of the barriers, we exclude less people. But they tend to arise from the assumptions that we make about other people. Uh, I love this phrase, the assumptions we make are encoded into what we build in the form of barriers. If we make an assumption about someone's vision, body, understanding, language, and it's a bad assumption, we create the barriers in the things we create. So that is, in a nutshell, what the BBC VR barriers research was all about. Document all them damn barriers. Go out to a heck of a lot of people and just see where the barriers were and document them and, and kind of sort them. So we did things where we built this like model of a school library. It had a sensory room and all this sort of stuff. And we went around all these schools and care homes and community groups. And we are having a whale of a time. But <laughs> we kind of hit this problem where there was a lot of users who couldn't hold the controllers, who couldn't interact with the controllers at all. And quite literally, they couldn't get through the door, even the virtual door. So we ended up having to experiment. So there's an example of some of the stuff we did where we used uh, an Xbox uh, XAC or ZAC uh, switch base and uh, built various things so that could be controlled. And uh, there's a website with all the control schemes and stuff that we developed on. Um, so that people could use this thing. So that was the project. As I said, methodology, something like 1,700 observations, over 100 participants. I then spent about a month and a half doing thematic analysis, which was incredibly fun when it was done and miserable the entire time I was doing it. But if anyone's ever done a thematic analysis, yeah, it's, uh, it's an experience. But yeah, I did that. And then we basically found that there are about 14 most common barriers uh, across three of the five groups we we're targeting. We didn't have enough data for hard of hearing and deaf barriers. So they're not included in the data set because we just didn't have enough data for it. So in a nutshell, the barriers that we observed on the motor side came from uh, holding orientation, press and hold, uh, simultaneous multiple input, and reach and balance. These, this is just like the cover slide. There's a full breakdown of what these all mean because they, they come from the data. But essentially, they all arise from assuming too many things. When we assume how many fingers somebody has and how they move, or when we assume that people can do two things at once with this finger and that finger, or when we assume that people can press and hold. So it's these assumptions that create the barriers, and it's the barriers that go on to exclude people, hence the VR Barriers Project, and that's kind of my background. Check out the website for a heck of a lot more info. The basic idea is that if we make these better assumptions, then we achieve better outcomes. So by questioning our assumptions, we can make things better and often we can sidestep the barriers we would have otherwise created. So that's the background that I'm coming from, but there's a little bit on the end that's kind of interesting. So uh, this is a photo from 2021. It's a bit upsetting, because in that photo, I'm dying of sepsis. That was not on my plan for 2021, if I'm honest, not on my agenda. Um, always been naughty, 
but I suddenly found myself properly wobbly as well. So when I had the sepsis, it did some damage to my spinal cord, uh, and I can't feel my feet as much as I used to anymore. Uh, and we built a three-legged, we built like a three-wheeled trike, and I got the buggy, and I started using a wheelchair and all sorts of other things. But interestingly, in all this time that I was trapped at home, the technology that I turned to was virtual reality. Suddenly, I found myself having done all of this research, uh, kind of applying it in my own life and around my home and, and in the things I used. So I used virtual reality flight sim stuff with Microsoft Flight Sim um, and all sorts of different bits of technology and 3D printed things and all sorts. Uh, and I really got into flight sim. I pushed really hard on it um, to the point where a couple of months ago, I started getting actual flying lessons um, because I'd done it all in VR. I'd learned it in VR. I'd learned all the procedures and I'd learned all the things you have to do. Um, so yeah, I started chatting to a, a flight school who specialized in disabled students and they went, yeah, sure, jump in a plane. I can't walk. But I can fly a plane. Um, and it was amazing. So when we do this thing, when we understand these barriers and we make these good assumptions, we have that task, right? We have that step where we turn potential into reality. Now, for me, that with VR, that was around flight. You know, I don't think I would have been had the confidence to go to the school or put myself forward if I hadn't done the stuff in VR. There was also amazing things like when we were taxiing out. I gave the instructor directions of where to go because I taxied to the airport so many times in Microsoft Flight Sim that I was less casually like, oh, yeah, all aircraft have to go left. And he was like, yes, they do. But the sign isn't there anymore. How did you know? I'm like, Flight Sim? Like, I've memorized this thing. So when we do this, yeah, it's about potential and reality. And if we just end up replicating the same barriers we have in real life, then we're missing out on a trick. So that's my goal, basically. That's the thing that I'm interested in in VR is, is flight sim is the thing I do most. Um, but that's that's the really underlying goal of most of the things I do. Potential into reality by understanding and removing barriers. So uh, that's me. I'm seven minutes and 40 seconds, which is surprisingly brief for me. Crikey. Uh, and my laptop wants to install a software update. Very well-timed laptop. Thank you very much. So yeah, that's it from me. Uh, I have a podcast called 1800 Seconds on Autism made by the BBC, jamieandlion.com. I've got Twitter and stuff like that. Just Google jamieandlion.com and you'll find my stuff. Uh, and that's me. Uh, cool. I shall hand back to Dylan. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jamie. That's uh, that's that's awesome stuff. Um, okay. And now I'll pass it over to Rick. Hi. All right. Uh, that was awesome, Jamie. Man. That was it's hard hard act to follow. Um, hold on here, let me get uh, okay. Screen two. I, I love the look of your product, though. I've, I've been looking at oh, it this well, morning, going, "Ooh, I can right. immediately see ten things I can use that for." All right, so let's see. I'm sharing, I believe. Um, and yep. let, let me get uh, get my slides here. I think ah, there I there I go. Okay. So um, I'm Rick Tat. I'm the co-founder of Glider uh, and CTO, and actually an inventor as well. Uh, oh shoot! I think I'm getting something across on the screen. Oh yeah, we can see a corner of your taskbar there. There yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. Let me get that that fixed. We should be okay. All right. Uh, so um, we've created a high precision high precision flip controller for video games, virtual reality, and other digital interactions. And I'll apologize, I am, I'm going to talk a little bit about regular gaming um, because our product applies to lots of things, uh, including gaming. And I'll talk about why gaming is kind of our focus. If you look at our Kickstarter and stuff like that, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, um, you know, we know that games are, are you originally started where maybe you could play it with five or six keys or, you know, and, and if you had certain abilities you might be able to play it with a few buttons with and and with the xbox adaptive controller but so many games have gotten much more complicated there's games that require 24 keys and a complicated mouse um and and they've also added more buttons and back paddles to mice you know buttons to mice and game back paddles to game pads made it just much more difficult so even those people with with great hand uh, capabilities, uh, find it difficult and fatiguing, and even uh, suffer injuries as a result. Uh, whereas virtual reality, and virtual reality is also very hand oriented. So is either hand controllers or gesture recognition seem to be the predominant ways to interact. Um, so let me introduce Glider. 
the first dual foot controller of its kind. It's created with uh, uni as a unique device that lets us use our feet with natural heel and toe movements. Uh, it has a bipedal design that, uh, that is capable of adding 16 actions uh, or you can, you know, specifically movement in the game setup. And it's designed to improve uh, performance and make playing more fun. Um, it's quick and easy to learn. Uh, you, know, you know, most people, if they have the flexibility of their feet, uh, can, can, and, you know, can use it and be up and running in minutes. Um, the way it came about, which I think maybe is interesting, is I was uh, on the board of a science museum. I was helping them come up with ideas for exhibits. And that led me to attend a, a talk about virtual reality at the University of Texas at Dallas, um, where I ultimately I ended up going to school for a master's degree in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and my background is software engineering, by the way, based in Plano, Texas. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm 72 years old and uh, just getting started in my life. Um, but um, I'm I, and I just got a degree from UTD. So um, I'm uh, I'm young at heart anyway. Um, so I was thinking about this virtual reality. I went to this lecture at the University of Texas, Dallas, and the, the, the professor talked about the latest, you know, headsets, what was going on. And he mentioned that locomotion in virtual reality was a problem. Well, the next morning I woke up after the talk and I was thinking, I just seen my nephew on his hoverboard zipping around, gliding around the house and gliding around the, the, the driveway on his hoverboard, which is just, if you're not familiar, it's a two wheel device um, that where each, where you stand on it and each foot controls the, the motion of the, the wheel on that side. So it's kind of like tank controls in that if you push forward on, on the side that you want to move, you're going to move that wheel. And so you can actually end up pivoting or um, or going forward in, or going off at an angle. And, and so I was like, oh man, could I use that as a way to move around in virtual reality with a digital device? And um, so I ended up initially getting some potentiometers and building some foot pads and getting an Arduino and, and ultimately, you know, figured out that I could use some Hall effect sensors for those that might be uh, aware of kind of technology. You can use these sensors that can detect magnet magnet um, range and, and it, that we use that so that it's a non touching. Uh, it will never wear out. So we use those sensors and then there's a processor in the middle that can combine the the, the tilt of the of the foot pads and use that to input either a, a key or a mouse click or a mouse movement uh, horizontal or up and down. I can actually tell uh, configure the device to be a mouse control and simply just control the mouse up, down, left, right using my feet. Or I can use it for uh, WASD and mouse in, in games that, that use WASD. Uh, there's actually also a flap um, and this this little animated GIF doesn't show it, but I can rotate my my the sole of my foot, just open it up a little bit by rotating my ankle outward, and that activates a switch that can be used for additional actions. Uh, some use it for strafing, for going left and right. Some use it for for pitch up and down, or you can use it for actions. Um, and because uh, well, I'll, in VR the the problem I ran into is there's just not many games that support external devices. They, they at least, it, the, at least the standard own headsets uh, like the quest. And so I kind of got dissuaded from that and started looking at video games and, and decided, Oh, Hey, I can work out of the box with all these kinds of uh, video games just by being a keyboard mouse input and, uh, or gamepad input. So, so that's the direction we went. And, you know, and I've talked to a lot of people like Mark Barlay over at Able Gamers and some of the other uh, warfighters engage. And and when I found uh, a lot of support for what we're doing to make it a commercial and a universal design, as opposed to something just for accessibility, um, because it's hard to get a commercial, especially as a startup, uh, commercial um, success and funding if you're just uh, aimed at, at, a, at the accessibility market. Uh, simply for, for, for gaming, it's simple. You put plug glider in or connect it over USB, pick a game profile, and you can have more than one profile and different 
you can customize your own and play a game. And we're actually going to have a hub where you can share profiles uh, for the different games. And, um, you know, you can delegate things like I've had people uh, playing uh, Madden um, football and using doing juking and spinning using their feet. Uh, we also have had people say, oh, can I just use this to do a screenshot or push to talk? Uh, and it's like, yeah, we can do really whatever you can do with a keyboard and mouse. Um, you can do with glider. And of course, we can connect with a MetaQuest game set or headset over Bluetooth as a game pad. And we've demoed it with our own Unity game and a few other games like InSpace that support a game pad. But we haven't pursued VR use very much uh, for that reason. And, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but there's just a limited number of Quest apps um, that, that support game pad. And so I've um, not, not pursued that as much as I'd like. Um, we did just have a Kickstarter. Oh, I wanted to talk about Quake Angel. Sorry. So Quake Angel uh, is a streamer in Houston that she's uh, normally playing with just her hands. She got, we met her at a, a LAN party and she got so excited that she wants to just play games just with her feet. And, and that's great. Um, we believe that Glider is often best used in combination with other, what other input uh, mechanisms you have. You don't have to do it just with your feet because there is only a limited amount you can do, even though it's, it's more, um, more capable than a lot of uh, foot devices. But uh, she plays Dead by Daylight, Pal World Lethal Company. And one day she was streaming uh, Pal World. And in create mode, you have to hold down a key basically the whole time you're playing um, building malls. And uh, and she was doing that with her feet. So she was able to pick up a bowl of cereal and eat, eat her bowl of cereal while she was uh, in create mode. So that's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, let's see. And uh, we just completed a Kickstarter. Um, we sold 450 gliders and we collected a little over 80,000. And we'll be delivering those later this year. Later this year, we haven't manufactured one yet, to be honest. We're working with a, a, a design firm right now to, to get it uh, completed, ready for manufacture. Uh, but we are going to have an online store open in the next few weeks to take more reservations. Um, and I put the uh, URL, which is feetlegal.com, into the, um, the chat. And um, Glider has capability really in, in the locomotion I, I can do, I can steer, I can uh, accelerate, I can back up and, um, and even turn so that, that it really can do a lot um, compared with a lot of the existing foot pedals on the market. That top one, the MSI Liberator, I don't think is accessible, available in the US at all. They, they did a Kickstarter and it kind of uses a, you have to kind of rotate your foot, but it's just three switches uh, that you'd activate with your toes and, um, and I think that's, you know, the, the um, Elgato Steam Deck. I I'm, I'm, can't remember which one that other one is. And of course, people use all kinds of bespoke things uh, and put things together with an, an X, Xbox adaptive controller or whatever. Um, we, you know, we just think Glider is just another option for people, who, you know, to experiment. And uh, of course, in, in the VR market, everybody gets excited about, about, all these locomotion methods where you stand and run around like on an Infinidec or Omni, um, you know, people were raving about Ready Player One. And it's like, um, I, I don't get excited about that because I'm not going to want to do that for very long. If I want to exercise, that's great. It's like a Peloton kind of situation, but we're not going to play very long. And, and people who have, so they're great for people who have the ability and the budget. Um, but in for Glider, I think it's going to take a little bit of a mindset uh, change or or some visionary in the industry. Um, maybe there's one on this call, hopefully, um, to to uh, to kind of maybe partner with Glider. Um, we're we're just an infant company. We're we're a corporation, but we've got and we've got some funding. Uh, we've had some friends and family investors and um, and the Kickstarter, so we're ready to go. But um, I was talking to, I went, I had a booth at the um, uh, AWE a couple of year and a half, it's two years ago now. 
and I was talking to the, the VR, uh, one of the guys from Vario, and I, you know, I said, hey, come over and look at my device. And he says, oh, I'm not really interested. We're, you know, people are happy standing and teleporting. Um, and I'm like, okay, if that's what you think. Um, and I even had somebody remark in a, in a forum that why does benefit VR would be so limited because it would tie a player down to having to sit. And I'm like, tie a player down to sit is like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but have you seen gamers? <laughs> They, they don't stand. Um, so I, I I didn't really think that sitting was a problem. Uh, but apparently, uh, for a lot of people and a lot of content, it's been built around standing. And so we hope that changes. And we think that glider can actually help that. Uh, and I was really excited when I saw the, the uh, Apple Vision Pro announcement, and they showed the woman um, demoing it seated. And I'm like, okay, so she's using hand gestures. But what if she wants other inputs? Uh, maybe Glider will fit into that uh, Apple Vision Pro uh, ecosystem. Um, there's been some other. Um, there's been some other um, um, uh, devices that have come out for VR uh, solutions, uh, like Cyber Shoes, uh, 3D Rudder, um, the uh, Stinky, and I think VR Go. I don't know what happened. It was a photo of the, the, the 3D rudder on there. Um, those guys are, are uh, uh, I don't know that any of those are available anymore. And I think it's because they were mostly uh, uncomfortable, but I'd love to hear uh, what people, uh, other people think. And uh, the only way uh, a company can make it, I think, is to find sufficient sales across people of all abilities. So um, um, we, let's see, uh, there we are. Um, so we have patents that have been granted, and that's going to be really helpful in getting funding. If you don't have patents, getting funded is 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 all right. Is, just a one minute warning for you here, so we can okay. make sure we get a right. equal time. So we got some patents. Uh, we started in in twenty eight. I actually came up with the idea in twenty seventeen and uh, started prototyping, and we formed Glider last May, and we had a Kickstarter, and we're working with this award winning design firm to get the product ready for manufacture. And that's that's my pitch or my presentation. So um, thank you for listening. Awesome, thanks, Bontrek. I'm sure there's definitely be some uh, a lot of questions about some of the the challenges that uh, you face so far with Glider in our our main session. But uh, for now, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Mar. Uh, you're muted, Mar. here hi everyone uh thank you for inviting me to this uh amazing community i'm learning so much um i didn't have um particular presentation prepared but i do have a presentation that i think fits well so let's start with that and and then we go with um so this is the thing I've been worried uh, for a bit now, um, is how do we click buttons in VR, kind of. Considering VR has created this paradigm shift of how we consider traditional computing, and it's not really so easy to, to remap our inputs and our outputs from the digital content as we know it until now. And so I've been exploring a bit a lot of these spaces that uh, what are the wonderful things you can do with this technology that you cannot do with any other technology. And I work a lot with avatars. I, I work with a Microsoft Soundscape project, uh, which was specific for accessibility also. Uh, I build prototypes for haptics. And, and then I also work a bit on this idea of locomotion bolt. And the whole idea there, um, We'll talk more about it, but is if you have many options, then you're better suited to give everyone what they need, right? And more recently, I've been looking at inputs. Um, <clears throat> the idea of the multiple options really was um, something that that came into the locomotion boat. We were kind to figure out how are people doing locomotion, so it's very linked to the uh, prior talk. And I want to highlight a number of things. It's, this is on the internet. It's the locomotionbolt.github.io. 
and share the link just now. Uh, but a few things is that as we have more sensors, we enable more possible ways to do interactions, right? So, for example, uh, gesture and grab type of um, locomotions only start after we start having good tracking of hands, right? So, for example. And, and this is something that I, I've been concerned for a while, the accessibility problem that we have. And I think it's totally understood everyone um, thinks of it that similar way. I think it's a paradox. It's because of these embodied interactions that we are trying to create. Um, and we have to remember that there are many situations or you know, permanent or situational moments in which we are all in need of some alternative input, right? Um, so I think the idea of embodied interactions is kind of a, we've been focusing too much in this, uh, we want to do one-to-one -one mapping. But the truth is that one-to-one -one mapping might not really be the best thing for VR, right? And I'm, I'm not even talking about impairments. Um, I think of, um, for example, a person who is very bad at playing tennis and goes to a VR game to be very bad at playing tennis. It feels like, what's the point, right? Like you should go there and feel like Rafa Nadal. So uh, I feel like uh, there is a gap there and it, uh, and it solves by decoupling the one-to-one -one mapping of our actions, right? So we did some sort of uh, research already on this and I, I've done other work on uh, physics of avatars, etc. I could give a very long talk. But I thought this one was a good one in which, okay, what if you cannot use the two hands? What are the alternatives you have? Can we figure out how people normally use hands um, in, in a coordinated or uncoordinated way? And then you find that most of the use of hands is asymmetric, right? Like um, you hold an object with one hand, you interact with the other, etc. So how can we create this in VR if you... Um, don't have access to one of the hands, right? And then we explore the whole of uh, that space. But in general, what I'm trying to find is that in VR, we're getting into this issue and we just put forward, this is a, the most recent issue of the Interactions magazine uh, of the ACM. And it's a wonderful uh, article. It's more like general public in a way on what I think are the guidelines for productivity. And productivity is just being able to efficiently click buttons in a way, right? So um, one of the things I find is that we need to have multiple ways to input. And also because we have all these possibilities of understanding what the human wants, the intent of the human, right? Through explicit inputs or implicit inputs. And we kind of, have the possibility to create very multimodal blends of uh, internal models, right? In which you perform an action uh, into the virtual environment and then you have the output part, right? Which is very related. And you cannot really have the input without the output because then you never learn the input. So we are always in learning every model. When we talk about learning curves, is precisely how long does it take for you to to do this interaction transfer function of this new input, right? Um, and then what can you do with it, right? Some inputs allow you to do selection, some inputs allow you to do multiple things, right? You might actually choose, okay, with this I do selection and then the confirmation with something that has far better accuracy, right? Like the click of the mouse for confirmation, selection with the gaze, for example. So I also think that the part of the problem of VR is this, uh, we need to, to go into hybrid scenarios that allow backward compatibility. That's kind of what I did when I work on the avatars for teams. I was working on avatars in VR and I was like, you know what? Avatars could be used also in, in 2D screens in, in, in video conferencing. And I think the, the other way around, right? Like we're focusing too much in the hand ray model for interaction in VR. And I'm worried that it's not even so great, right? Because any motor um, impairment you have, even uh, as a regular full body able person, you're gonna amplify the problem at the finalize of the arc of the function of the, the radius, right? So you're like, uh, 
uh, it, it doesn't work well. And also, it, it prevents you from using these uh, with other technologies that we already know how to use, right? Imagine when we ship the smartphones, you wouldn't be able to send SMS to the other phone. Uh, I don't think a smartphones would have taken so strongly, right? I mean, there is something about being able to transfer your skills and be able to be compatible with the existing technology. So what we're uh, thinking a lot now is how do we use the current inputs to shape the future of XR inputs, right? So I, I'm putting out two forms um, that I'm interested on, on hearing what people have to say. One is about accessible inputs. I want to create similar to these barriers that uh, um, were presented just now, uh, which I loved. It's kind of what are the input systems that people are using, right? That all of you are using for what type of impairment? and for what type of device, for what type of use, right? And, and then if you have also links or something. So I'm trying to compile a bit of this ethnographic study to see, okay, how now, how do we bring these inputs there? If it's an accessible mouse, if it's an accessible keyboard, if it's, you know, all of these things should be compatible with VR, right? It shouldn't be just about hand raise. Um, and then the other part, which is more with the output that we were mentioning, is like, okay, when you have this accessibility, right, how can we, um, what are you using it for, right? It's more of a use. And then in particular, more about the output, if anyone is using some of assistive technology. So one is more about input and more about output. Of course, it intersects, right? I'm using this and I'm using this particular input for that particular output, and how do you want the output, right? Do you want it spoken, text, visual, et cetera? So we're trying to put forward these two uh, uh, forms to gather a bit more information, and I'm happy to discuss about them um, during the talk today. Awesome. Um, Thanks, Mara. Yeah, hopefully we'll get... Yeah. Um, We'll be able to share those uh, surveys and get some good data here. Yeah, I'll share them now on the on the post here. Awesome, um, great. So I think at this point we're going to go ahead and open it up uh, to to the community here. Um, again, just the the focus of this what is alternative inputs, and so building on what our our speakers have been talking about. Um, we want to consider things like, uh, you know, how can people who have challenges accessing traditional controllers and interaction paradigms interact in VR? Um, how can we ensure all kinds of input devices are compatible with XR hardware? Um, what types of barriers have people here faced in making that happen? Um, and also, what are the, the best practices for things like customizing buttons and motion controls? I, I know one thing that's been on my mind for a while is, it's one thing to remap one button to another button, but how do I remap a motion to a button or vice versa? Um, so I think with that, we'll, we'll open it up. And uh, anybody, please uh, don't feel shy to, to unmute your mic um, okay. or to ask questions in chat and, and have at. Uh, I can answer your question slightly on the first one about remapping axes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's an application that I use quite a lot on, um, on the Microsoft Flight Sim stuff. Uh, which I think is open track. I'm just Googling it as we speak, um, which does eye and other device tracking. So you can take an axis. So what I'll quite often do is when I'm using my TV rather than my headset, I want it. So as I turn my head, the TV turns the camera. Yeah. Um, but you don't necessarily want it that it's one to one. Cause if you turn your head 90 degrees, you can't see the TV anymore because you've turned your head 90 degrees. So you use this open track uh, application and I take a, a Vive uh, controller, uh, zip tie it to my headphones, and then I use its position to drive the camera. Um, and this, this application can then modify all the inputs, remap them, put in different curves and stuff. Um, it would also work in VR exactly the same way because the underlying application doesn't actually know, you know they're not connected. So um, yeah, open track. I'm just googling it now to give you a link. Yeah, please do. We'll we'll add that to our uh, our GitHub for sure. Um, 
Uh, also, if anybody uh, noticed the, in the chat, we had somebody talk about uh, the walk-in VR driver, which is uh, an excellent um, service that's been out for a while now that lets people kind of remap uh, VR controls on Steam to do things like um, enable co-pilot or uh, make the controller further away or pretend to be standing up, things like that. Um, Karen. Hi, um, sorry for the background noise. I'm actually in a loud place. So um, one thing that came to mind, this is great learning for me, um, I'm not a designer, game designer per se, um, but I attended um, the, ex, uh, the Global Health and Virtual Reality Conference a couple of years ago in, at Vanderbilt University. And um, I saw a t-shirt in the back, it said something like smell a vision or something like mm. that. And I, it was during COVID, so I wasn't about to put all these, all this stuff on my face. But that one I did. And it was, it was a technology that, uh, for instance, it had four scenes. You could you choose a scene. I chose a campfire with marshmallows. You put all the stuff on. You, you see these two balls. You touch the balls. Um, you grab the balls. Uh, with the you know the controllers, and you bring it closer to your face, and you can smell marshmallows. There were uh, there was a rose scene. There was like a a seacoast scene. I, I it was just amazing. Just so thinking about smell somehow to add into the sensations mm -hmm. of, of uh, what we can experience. I don't know yeah. if anybody has any thoughts on that, but it just occurred to me that that's another sensation, right, that we all have, or don't have sometimes. <laughs> but I, I will say, I, I think smell is an output form of output is very interesting. I'd be very concerned about smell as an input. I don't know what I how, you know <laughs> want to know how you're generating those smells, but uh, <laughs> no, it's it's a very good question. I think the, the sensory devices, uh, I mean, virtual if where we're going to get the the full virtual reality smell would certainly be an interesting component of that. It's the smell that I use to tell when the popcorn's cooked. <laughs> you know, you right. listen for two seconds between each pop. And it doesn't smell like burnt popcorn yet, basically. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask more. I, I would like to get glider on the locomotion vault list. And I tried a couple of years ago to email whoever, and it never never got on there. So uh, uh, we, we can uh, put it in. It's, it's one of these things that is very hard to maintain, because if you open it for anyone to maintain, then yeah, uh, it goes a bit crazy. Yeah. Um, so we haven't managed a way. It became more of a frozen place, but um, we're send me um, a short video of it, like the yeah. one you share there, and I can add it. I will just Thank add you. it. Appreciate that. Uh, awesome. uh, one more question, briefly, if I may. So oh, yeah. I was. Sorry. I did a. I collaborated on a program creating accessible future and around quote unquote disability tech last summer in, in Boston, and it was in an innovation center. And Perkins School for the Blind was one of the partners, um, and they have a whole actually the How Innovation Center within Perkins. If anybody uh, wants to, you know, collaborate um, with. Uh, you know, a center that is really working hard on developing new technologies um, uh, for people that have visual impairments. Pretty cool. But I wonder, are there people that are developing VR, XR for people that are blind? Um, yes. How does that work? Uh, we actually did some of this at the BBC with the... Um, Gosh, it's the what is it? It's the Veterans Blind, Blind Veterans Association, and we had a number of users who were low vision or had uh, different levels of blindness, um, where they, they, they the feedback numbers they could actually see better in VR than they could in real life. Um, so if you look on the website for the different barriers, there's the, the most common barriers for low vision users, uh, which are often things like contrast. You know, we gave them white hands against a white wall and then they couldn't see their hands. Whoops. Um, but yeah, because the screens are very bright, they can that, that really helps with lots of different vision impairments. The other thing that we were able to do 
uh, was basically dynamically changing the font sizes. Um, and by dynamic, I mean, before the blind people used it, I logged in, changed the font size in Unreal, recompiled it very quickly and pretended it did that automatically. But um, yeah, we made all the signage and stuff larger within the VR environment so that it would suit their vision. Um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of potential there. Um, and it was one of the things that came out of the BBC VR study that's kind of like similar to like dynamic type on iOS, being able to have that sort of feature within VR or have some sort of profile that you could load into a headset and then have the headset um, semantically understand what the render calls are for things like text and then be able to do cool things with it so you can, you know, make it larger, move it around, all that sort of thing. So there is some work going on there. It's quite cool. Yeah, I'll say there's definitely a lot of work going on uh, here at our Extra Access. Our executive director, Sherry Asencott, um, her lab at Cornell, does a lot of work on on kind of low vision and VR. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely encourage folks to, to read up on that. I put the link in the tab. I do I do want to keep us um, focused on inputs though, because low vision this low vision could definitely go a long ways uh, just on that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll vouch for Perkins School of Mind. I, I did their uh, bus stop challenge as part of my master's thesis um, using AR. And uh, there's some there's some questions around how blind folks can use input um, in VR. But I think let's let's keep on inputs mm -hmm. for the moment. And Karen, um, very much appreciate the question. One um, of the D interesting. Oh, go ahead, Jamie, and then and then after that, I see David has his hand up here. Oh, sorry. Um, one of the interesting barriers that I've been facing on the VR flight sim stuff is when I have, say, a real-world checklist you know, of how to start a PA-28 up, and all your pre-flight checks, but I'm also in VR, and kind of getting the mixed reality side of it going is very complicated. So it's like, how do you replicate turning a page on a checklist within VR? Because I can get the object into VR without too many problems, but then the interactions with it are very complicated, versus when you're in a real plane, you, you have a kneeboard that you have it strapped to, and you just flick it with your finger sort of thing. So there's also things like when you are dealing with inputs in VR, if the user can't see them because they're not represented within the environment, um, which would be one of my questions for like glider. If I was using the glider, I'd want to be able to look down and see it under my feet the same way that I could see my control inputs because then I can make the connection between the input and my movement. So I don't know if anyone's working on anything to do that sort of thing. That would be very handy. Um, you mean is that is that kind of like what you're talking about, like the um, being able to see the keyboard in VR? Yes, well, just being able to see the keyboard. So, like, if you're on a Quest Three or something, you can or a Vive. There's a 3D representation of the controllers you're holding within right. the game, um, yeah. so that you can look down at them and see what you're doing. Um, as someone who has extremely numb feet, <laughs> that'd be quite useful for me because no, right. I'll be glancing down, going, "Oh, that's what my foot's doing." That's what. That's I'm really good. That's a really good suggestion. Yeah, I think there's definitely a question of feedback and some of these input mechanisms. Um, I want to call on David and then Justin uh, after that. Yeah, so I just wanted to say this is what I do uh, in our game, and I just I thought I'd just run over what we do. Um, maybe it'll help you guys. Um, so we have a driving game, um, and most of our users are using wheels and pedals. It's a sit-down game. About 20% of them are on VR. Um, and we found um, that we have a, a very large uh, group of people that are, that are uh, struggling with various disabilities using our game. And we found we were able to support them really well by, um, by, by being as flexible as possible with our inputs. So I put in code ages ago to make it so that you could drive the whole, the whole sim with just one analog input and two digi digital ones. Um, um, and that, you know, that automatically just opens it up so that, you know, if, you, if you're driving with one hand and no feet or whatever, you, you can suddenly uh, accommodate that, you know, um, um, that helps a lot. You know, as someone mentioned earlier that, you know, games with 20 inputs, um, you know, we we can we can get around all that by having aids that kick in to, to automate all those controls, um, and then we every input that we have is is able to be remapped. So there's no, um, you know, outside of that one analog input for steering, um, everything can be mapped to a mouse button, or a joystick, or a keyboard, or uh, you know, and then that opens it up to all of the disability inputs that that are out there. You know, so if you're using a a, a suck puff 
input, you know, it, it automatically works because that can emulate a keyboard or, or a joystick. Um, and that that seems to help a lot. And then, and then we've spent a lot of time working with uh, device manufacturers. Um, it, when we started, there was no uh, hand controls built into wheels for, for driving games. And so I spent a lot of time working with them, encouraging them to say, look, let's put put hand controls on these devices. And, and now we have, uh, there's probably 20 devices on the market that have hand controls and that, that you know, automatically opens it up to to all the people that were struggling before um, that, that didn't have use of their feet. Um, yeah, so anyway, I mean, that's, this is all what we've been doing. Um, and I'm glad to see everybody's working on it. So I just wanted to put it out there that, that what we've really found is just be as broad as you can be, you know, don't, don't try to focus in on one solution. Every, everybody's got a unique solution. You know, we've had users driving with their toes. We've got users, you know, um, using a mouth joystick or, um, you know, uh, or head tracking to steer, um, you know. Um, and as long as we're uh, as accommodating as possible on the inputs, it, it all seems to, to come out in the end. Not, so. not all game development companies are as accommodating as you, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, David, feel free to, to post a link to your game in the in the chat if you have one. I, I'd be very interested in, in seeing it. I know we had um, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron, Guck, Aaron Guck, I think, uh, did, I think, his PhD on, on in part, on kind of accessible driving games. Um, so that it's definitely a, a subject of interest. Sure. Uh, Justin, go ahead. Oh, did we did we lose you? Saw your hand raised for a moment. Can you hear me? There you are. Yep. Okay. I'm so sorry. My microphone's in a uh, strange location. Um, the question that I wanted to ask, or the sort of concept that I wanted to pose, is um, something that has helped me out, and and some of the different groups that I've worked with, where trying to sort of reimagine if we're creating inputs or we're creating interfaces for virtual reality, you know, maybe reimagining the paradigms by which we evaluate success or, or what a good interface looks like. And an example of that is that like so many of the interfaces that we use for most things um, rely on sort of like abstract or symbolic logic, right? You know, there's like a button that says play and you press play. <laughs> And then the thing begins to function. Um, and, and that works really well for like flat screen media. You know, it's we're, we're looking at symbols and we're using symbols to talk to them. Um, but virtual reality is sort of unique in that it's it's not, even though it is technically a symbolic interface, like the stuff's not really there. Your body feels the presence of those things as though they are present with you. And so in terms of interacting with those objects or those um, experiences, you know, we started trying to think of what would a concrete interface look like, you know, rather than pressing buttons, like what would it mean to use an interface that had a, a very direct and real relationship to the virtual world? And that's how I'm going to be talking about it in a couple of weeks at the symposium, but that's how we ended up um, doing some studies with uh, wheelchairs in VR, right? It was the idea of like, I'm sitting in this chair, I want to go somewhere, I just go there. Like I just roll the wheels and that's where it takes me. And that it's that, um, that there's a sort of direct relationship between what you're doing and the result that you get. Um, and I, I guess the question is then in terms of, like I can see that presenting both opportunities and challenges to making more widely accessible interfaces because that idea of remapping you know in some ways relies on a kind of symbolic logic right you know it's like i press button a and instead of it doing what it did and now i'm going to switch that to button b but what does it look like if you're trying to create an accessible interface that um isn't button based rather it's a uh, um a kind of tactile or tangible interaction with the world and what would be the paradigms similar to how we create accessibility in real world spaces that would make those kinds of interfaces more accessible 
I hope I didn't ramble too much. I... <laughs> well, no, it's, it's an interesting question because I think there's a, a certain opposition between um, when it comes to abstraction, right? I think it, it, one of the, the things that is fantastic about VR is that sense of immersion of that one-to-one like, -one action of, you know, if I want to swing a sword in VR, I can actually swing a sword. If I want to move a wheelchair, I can actually like roll wheels, right? But I think there's a, a, a tension between that and accessibility sometimes, because that very idea of, you know, I want to be able to swing my sword to actually swing my sword. Well, if you can't swing a sword in real life, we don't want to bar you from that. Um, so it, it's a good question. I think for me, it, it partially goes back to that that question of how do we take those those actions, those movements, and remap things like that. Um, I think part of it is done through abstraction of rather than saying, uh, you, you know, I want I want to pick up that item over there. Um, it's not necessarily that we're abstracting, moving, you know, moving down, moving forward, and grabbing, as much as we're abstracting that action of pick up the thing. Uh, and there, there's a fine line because in different situations, move down, move forward, and grab could be an entirely different th action than pick up the thing. That could be activate that controller. It could be, you know, any number of things. Um, and so I, I'm curious if anybody here has worked on those different types of abstractions, those different types of remapping, um, of remapping a, a function versus remapping a movement input. We um, did. I know that's the... something that's. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, we did this with the VR project. So we mm -hmm. had a bookcase with all the books on it. Um, and a running joke was that the books about space didn't have any gravity applied. And an autistic kid built the world's first space book particle collider where he teleports off the of the room, throw them across, etc. But um, yeah, for wheelchair users who couldn't reach the floor, uh, we had a button that would snap the last object they touched back into their hand. And getting users to understand what it did was the hardest challenge because how do you know they dropped a thing? What did they drop versus intentionally put down, etc.? So that's where we came to the last thing that was in your hand will just reappear back in your hand. It didn't animate the object come from the floor. That object disintegrated and the same thing appeared in your hand because that was just much more understandable. When we tried to animate it, people didn't understand what it was doing. Um, so we've, done, we've played with things like that. Something that we started playing with but turned out to be horrifically complicated to implement was time travel. So we were like, well, you just roll me back five seconds. Turns out it's really hard to do that in a game engine. They insist on having time go forward. Their physics engines are really harsh about that. So yeah, it turns out really hard to do that. But that was the other idea that we had, like a, a, a real life undo button, you know, um, where you could hit a button and jump back five seconds, a bit like, you know, skip on a, on a video on YouTube. So we played around with those things. But the other thing that we found kind of interesting um, was that people very quickly grokked sort of compound actions, you might put it. So one of the things that we had was if you teleported to certain places, it would automatically do certain things. Um, and when we had that set up, people would very quickly grok it. The, oh, if, if I want to reset, I teleport to here. Um, so that sort of thing also worked, but people would understand that, a, you know, standing on this piece of ground shouldn't reset everything and reset the room, but it does. And I've understood that, you know, real life isn't like that. I can't go and stand in my hallway and just have my bedroom tidy itself. But we could in VR and people really like that because they already knew how to move and they didn't have to learn a new interaction or reach out and touch something. Um, the other thing that we saw in VR that was quite interesting was we had a wheelchair user come up to one of our bookcases and very slowly drive. So we had it so the user could move around the room or they could teleport. And we had the, they, they maneuvered up to the bookcase and very slowly drove along the side of the bookcase, reading the spines of the books and said, I've always wanted to do this. I've never been able to do that. I can't get close enough in the real world. Um, so that was another example where like an emergent interaction of reading the spines of a bookcase that I, I would take for granted for them was a whole new experience. Um, I've got an example of cognitive and mobility things colliding with each other as well, but I'll save that because I can tell that I'm monologuing. No, those are some great examples. Uh, I, I have some other things in mind, but I want to give uh, folks here the, the chance to to ask questions or to answer some of the things that have come up before I, I put anything else forward. I want to add also something about the physics remapped. 
we did this experiment um, where, you know how you traditionally will just cross objects because you don't, you know, like if you do a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, you get through the door or like anything in VR, right? So people actually much more prefer to not have a one-to-one -one mapping, but have the object collide with the whatever you were encountering from a first-person perspective, right? Like your avatar, um, than any other option. And and this was true for both passive, right? Like something touches you, as well as uh, you touching something. Um, and there was quite a bit of dynamic range as to, you know, almost 20 centimeters were even perceived like the hand is where my hand is, right? So you wouldn't even feel that you had the touch from the actual hand. Uh, so I doubled down on the using physics uh, is a very good way to, to match the input to the output. So, sorry, Mario, you're, you're saying that people don't like one-to-one -one interactions in terms of like reaching out and touching things, or could you give an example of that? Um, yeah, actually, I have a video here that I can share sure. with you here on the link. Um, but yeah, this is a touching things or any any interaction that you have that is not totally match, um, because there is not perfect tracking, right? Like, a, or you have a virtual object that you cannot you don't have in the real world. So your whole, you know, a motor control mechanism works in the following way. You have the intention of your action and then the execution. But then normally you will have correction mechanisms, right? But in virtual reality, the correction mechanisms of, I reach the destination, the haptic part of it, the feedback, as you were saying, uh, in neuroscience, they call it the afferent uh, signal, right? It's coming from the outside. Um, you don't have that. So you continue and, and your hand is very hard to do manipulation of objects because you, you miss on the target. You overshoot or undershoot. It's much easier to end up in that type of situations in VR, partially because the perceptual visual is not very as reliable as reality, right? Like we're kind of tricking still. Um, but then also because you don't have that feedback to correct. So what ends up happening is like, okay, you're playing piano, but your fingers are getting into the keys. Or, you know, there are a lot of situations in which you are breaking physics. So people do prefer physics um, than, um, you know, to have a one-to-one. -one. Okay, my real hand is like this, but in the virtual world, it's going to hold the cup, not be inside the cup. Right. So that, that video you just shared, you know, if you're walking through a column that isn't actually there in real life, but your avatar is walking straight through a steel column. It, you're saying it's better to to have the avatar just walk through the column as opposed to having the avatar bounce off while you keep going. The best is to have the avatar bounce. Oh, it is best to have the avatar bounce. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. Which is a bit counterintuitive, but yeah. Uh, Jamie, I yeah, think but, we have a better in our, video in our, uh, in our with our uh, glider. Uh, we have incorporated some haptics. So what we would do in that case, if we could work with the game developer, uh, when you encounter that column, the the glider would vibrate, so that you'd have a sense that that something happened at least. I have a couple of examples from our research where we encountered exactly this. So my my two favorite ones was. Um, users would get very confused if they did something like put a mug on a table and it didn't make a noise which was something i spent a very long time trying to work out how to do in a realistic way turns out mugs make really specific noises depending on how hard you put them down and how level they are with the table that you're putting them on and then speaking to like an acoustic engineer who was like <laughs> good luck um but um yeah when you people put things down and it didn't go clunk that was one of the things people would pick up on um, another example of like visual thing of that is things like if you have rooms that don't have skirting boards, people, you know, the little bits of wood around the corner of the floor, people would notice they were missing and just feel, oh, it doesn't feel quite right. And it would be things like missing skirting boards that would do it. And not that that's an interaction thing, but it's just another example of this, like expectations. And one of the things that we did in the research 
Uh, let me just go find the research that I should be able to remember off my heart by now. But you know, this was this was more than ten minutes ago, so you know, it's 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 gone from my brain. One of the things that we had in the barrier in the barrier browser around cognitive barriers was comprehension and expectation. So this uh, expectation, which is two two and two two one. Uh, this barrier occurs when an expectation. Well, this barrier occurs when an experience breaks a user's expectation, such as expected sounds or shadows, expected bodily representation, or unexpectedly placing the user in a simulated unsafe situation. So that's sort of like expectations of what things should do based on physics and our understanding of the world, and the way we break them. That there's both gameplay opportunities in there, but there's also risk for causing exclusion, confusion, or another one. Um, I have another very short example, and then I'll shut up. But um, we were working with a user who has a learning impairment, um, a learning disability, and she was extremely anxious. And we'd explained to her very carefully that everything in the environment isn't real. You're okay. You're safe. And we had this. You know, we were using the Steam VR home environment, the, like the little nice house on a mountain, and butterflies were flying around. She was very happy. And then the facilitator picked up the controller and handed it to her, and of course she completely freaked out. Because we told her that nothing was real. And then something got up from the floor, floated towards her and bumped into her. Right. So this like making sure people understand what is and isn't real and then having those things behave the way they expect or intentionally having something behave a way that doesn't work the way they'd expect, like books that don't have gravity applied, for example, they can help people understand the space that they're in and why. Um, and then the final, final one, because I'm on a roll, uh, we had a user uh, who was a stick user um, who wouldn't walk into the garden because the garden had cobbles and she knew she couldn't walk on cobbles. And we had to go, oh, no, they're virtual cobbles. The floor is still flat. You... But that's a behavior that she's had for 20 years. She didn't, in, until she was asked, she didn't know why she hadn't walked into the garden. And then she was, well, it was cobbled. And then she was like, oh, yeah. No, good point. So it's like, that sort of cognitive motor neurology feedback cycle, you know, if she'd stepped onto it and not felt the cobbles building on what um, uh, Ma was saying there, then maybe she would have built that confidence, but she didn't want to try it because of her expectations. So, yeah. I think that's why, for example, all the emotion redirection works super well, because you're having that online calibration of your uh, tracking of where you're going and so you really divert people very far away from the original target so they use it for haptic retargeting but it can be used for anything really right to a point that if you can redirect movements so if if your ultimate use of vr is to do motion learning for example you don't even need haptics anymore Right, like if you can redirect the movements of people in a subjective or even active way. But um, anyway, yeah, I do think that um, I work on these uh, neuroscience aspects for very long. And then I figure that every time I use a device, I'm like, man, it's so hard to even just click something. <laughs> like, um, you know, productivity, how do you even go and work your day in one of these devices when you know the keyboard is like this i'm so i'm kind of concerned about this idea that we are not providing for inputs and problems that have been solved in the past right like just connect a keyboard or just like um you know can we not be as good as the other devices um so i think that uh Part of it is why I, I'm also thinking of, oh, what are the things that the community is using for accessible inputs? And that's uh, why I came here, right? But um, a bit of this, can we do a survey of, okay, I use this type of button this way and I use this type of thing. So we just bring it in. So when you come inside, it's a cognitive load zero. It's just, you change the visual input Mm -hmm. And then you can have games that are more uh, embodied or you have, um, you know, all these different locomotion techniques or, you know, many ways. But just the barely basics should be far more um, backward compatible. 
Hmm. Uh, Maz, have you, uh, Ma, sorry, have you played with um, virtual de desktop at all on Quest or PC? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have a they have an environment that's a desk. Yeah, I know. And, um, I set my desk up to match the virtual keyboard to where my real keyboard was, um, mm -hmm. and I felt so much more comfortable. I would yes. love to be able to represent my real keyboard on that desk. That would make it yeah. so much more usable to me. Um, I know. That would be amazing. There are a bunch of things. Every time I have like just the, the screens that I want to put, and you know, I'm like, I feel like there could be better ways to do it. But I'm also, you know, not only for, um, but also particularly for people who use technology as an enabling, right? Like in general, I think that's where I want to make sure we don't, leave, like we solve this, but we still leave a gap, right? I don't want to leave this gap. And so I'm trying to really figure out what are these inputs that people really use for the regular digital life are you on the phone are you on the um you know and then this should be there also right and i think we will all use them not it's not you know like you yeah. say having the keyboard there is super useful for everyone i mean i would love to see a, a feature where, where xr is so flexible that you could just come in with whatever you have right whether it's a mouse and keyboard whether it's a sip and puff controller or you know full six off controllers or anything and just pop into an app and have it work right and mm -hmm. kind of remap um you know if not remap automatically then at least have a process to to remap and, and just to to minimize that burden on the user of trying to to customize their control every single time they do it um yeah. one, one thing i'd really love to to ask some of the, the people here is you know let's take that example if you have somebody who's coming in who uses maybe a sip and puff controller um which if you don't know it's a, a controller uh that many quadriplegic people will use because it's um you just sip or puff on different uh kind of breathing tubes uh in order to activate different switches um for somebody like you know who's using that what right now what vr apps would they be able to use um and for software and hardware creators what do we need them to do in order for for these types of devices to be accommodated right like i know so, quest and things have a certain amount of like bluetooth uh baked in of oh yeah. we'll connect to whatever device but yeah i'd love to hear more about that and the, the challenges that people face in that right now I can talk you through the things we've built to do. So um, mm -hmm. the Xbox adaptive controller connected via Bluetooth is just supported by the standard Xbox driver. Um, and it also has its own remapping software, which is really useful. So if it's PC VR, so it's kind of not integrated into the headset, then anything that will support an Xbox controller will, will work. Um, I was just about to type that one of my examples is playing a game called SnowRunner with an Xbox controller or the XAC. The XAC is a base that has all the three and a half millimeter jacks in the bottom. So on a puff tube, it just completes a circuit across a three and a half mil jack. So you just plug the jack into the back of the XAC in whichever button you want it to emulate. Have you played with kind of those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. um, so once you have the XAC working, any other type of accessible, you know, any other type of setup you want can just plug into the back of it. Um, it's either Able Gamers or the Vision Minecraft people. I can't remember. Um, who had a brilliant example of this where they'd taken all of the three and a half mil jacks and they'd 3D printed like a frame. So they were all held with the right spacing. So you could plug them all into the back of the XAC in one go. And I think the guy was moving from his car driving setup to his playing FIFA setup by just pulling it out with a handle, grabbing all the other bundle of cables and shoving it back in. It was, it was very clever. Nice. Yeah, do, I guess, do we have an idea in terms of supporting Xbox controller compatibility. Is that something that we feel like most of the major platforms do at this point? Uh, or are there lots of headsets and devices out there that won't support that? Because I know, um, I think somebody was saying the, the Apple Vision Pro, for all that it has some great accessibility options, uh, do we know if that supports alternative inputs? There's a Bluetooth HID standard. As long as you support yeah. that in, your, in the headset, it anything should be able to emulate a, a, a Bluetooth gamepad. Yeah. So I don't know how many uh, 
VR games do it, but I mean, I would think most of them do. Most most even phone games support Bluetooth. It's, HID. It's, it's a lot of the advice I end up giving clients, which is is two things. It's the Xbox having an Xbox driver also makes it way easier for your developers to test things because you can automate them very easily. But it also means that you're giving more options to people to build whatever input setup they need. But if they don't have that method into the stack, there's nothing they can do. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think it's the um, uh, is it HP Reverb? Is that a headset that I'm thinking of? There's so many different ones. Um, no, that was a P. Oh gosh, there, there's a Vive one that was standalone that didn't have a, or it was a HP one that was standalone, and it was a completely walled garden. There was absolutely no way into it. Whatever, you couldn't run it against a PC. You couldn't give it a Bluetooth input of anything other than its own controllers. We need to sort of find ways to encourage platform owners not to do that to leave that software hole that we can then, you know, connect other things to. Well, and I, I'd encourage people not to um, just do the Xbox X input on PC, at least, but go back to the older direct input. Oh, um, good, there's good. so many devices that aren't X input compatible because Microsoft's limited that to only their products or licensed products. So. I'm, I'm referring to to both. Some yeah. So, but I mean, but, yeah. the more you can support, the better. Is yeah. there an open open source standard for this type of thing as well? No. No. They're I mean, all they're operating system specific. Yeah. Hmm. I'm sure and, there's wrapper APIs, but they, they're always kind of poor. So, so I I put a thing in chat, but the observation that I've had is, and I'm trying to do something with this now, where you have for instance, in Unity, you have the the input system that has, you know, events where it's like, you know, you have your, you tag something as like, my main button does X and you can set it up so that like that, whatever is defined as the main button would be different for every controller. You know, like if you're on a PC, that might be a mouse click on a, a keep like a gamepad, it might be like a, the A button, et cetera. And that's like, in some ways, a really wonderful tool that makes remapping and accessibility somewhat easier. The downside though, is that from the, the development end, when you're trying to accommodate um, those kinds of tools that are within a specific development environment, well, they change and update those things all the time. So it's like you you create something and it works, but then kind of like the problem that, that Mar had where it's like, you know, well, we would update it, but like it's more than you know, right? It's more complicated than you think. And I think that, uh, you know, what you want is a balance there where you have kind of these embedded modular systems that can be remapped to more accessible interfaces, but you also need some approach that's not constantly changing every three months when you know a a, a for-profit company decides to say you know have a different way that they want to do things and now you know if you change anything it breaks your whole program you know i think that there's a sort of like pro and con to it um yeah so he's... one of the go ahead jamie one of the discussions i've had with a client recently um i'm trying to work out how to phrase it um they basically had two options. They could rely on the remappability that was available on the platform that they were using, or they could build their own much easier to understand remappability interface within the game itself. So when you went into some options, you could pick the mapping that you've got, um, but they could then be specific and say, jump, climb, da 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 da, and give a visual and, and everything else. And they wanted to support the XAC, Xbox controller, generic things. Um, and, you know, the difference in cost between those two options was a six-digit figure. Um, those sorts of trade-offs are very painful to make. So I, I hear what you're saying about kind of having to try and keep these things working when you when, when they're proprietary. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why I suggest just supporting Xbox controllers and, you know, generic Bluetooth controllers. Um, at least on, you know, the two main, you know, the Xbox and the PC, you know that Microsoft is going to keep on top of that. Um, the only downside of that is sometimes when they update it, it ends up updating one of the redistributables. I'm sort of looking sideways at David because he sounds like you're much closer to this to me. I think it's the .NET redistributable. can't remember. Uh, and it chucks a warning at the error at the user going, ooh, download this 
600 meg update and they would have literally changed one key in an xml file <laughs> like that's exactly really... what i'm talking about yeah, yeah. it mm. yeah it really is annoying um uh, jamie you mentioned i think in your chat that it, how easy it is to add uh alternative inputs in unreal and i think in mm -hmm. the same it's the same thing with with uh with unity uh how can we get game companies to add um those that are building apps for standalone quest to add um you know just game controller input okay. so the xbox game controller or, or generic game controller because then then that would enable all of us with alternative inputs to, to interact yeah. Is um, I think it's advocacy and education. I've sat in rooms of developers at AAA studios and gone, no, 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 no. You don't need to do anything special to support that complicated switch setup. It just run. It just pretends to be an Xbox controller. And there's literally a room of developers going, oh, we don't have to write a custom driver for the pop puff tube. No, but what about this Bluetooth proximity switch? Nope, all taken care of for you. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. So I think a lot of it is like education and, and awareness, but then within that, that's at like the developer side, but there's also on the product, the product ownership, making it an expectation when you bring a game to market. I think that's one of the most powerful things. Um, so to side goes slightly into the iPhone and Apple. Um, mm. I'm hoping that the Apple uh, Vision Pro does for eye gaze control, what the touch screen, what the iPhone did for the touch screen. So before the iPhone, touchscreen design was a weird peculiarity thing that some people did. Now everybody knows touchscreen design. With the eye gaze control within the Apple Vision Pro, it's, I'm hoping it will do the same thing. And it will get people thinking about things like gaze control, where you do actually have to engineer something in. But yeah, when, when, when people talk about gaze control and switch control in the same sentence, I quite often have to go, no, no, no. These two are fundamentally different in the amount of effort it takes to actually implement this. Yeah, um, for sure. One of the, I, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, well, I do want to shout out to Apple that they have, uh, for those gaze controlled, they have the flexibility of, do you want to use left eye or right eye? Do you want to use your eyes yeah. or your head? Do you want to use, you know, when you're pointing at things, do you want to point with your finger? Do you want to point with your wrist? Um, they, they definitely put a lot of flexibility in there for people who, you know, I know there's a lot of gaze controls that don't work properly because people have central vision loss, um, yeah. things like that. So uh, I think building in that type of flexibility in systems uh, is definitely important as well. It's building a little bit on what Ma was saying earlier about implicit versus explicit control, right? Where you're, where you're, if if your interaction can follow where your eyes are already naturally moving, that's quite was quite powerful. It's the same as the um, the two D flight sim turning the camera to where your head is pointing. You know, the right. first time I set that up, I had a oh, I'm actually now flying a plane. Versus otherwise, I was sitting in the plane going, okay, where's my runway? I'll just use this little fiddly thumbstick to whoop, change my head. When you're actually in a real life plane, you don't have to do that. You just look out the window. And virtual flight rules, you're mostly looking out the window. So being able to naturally look out the window, the same way I do in VR, uh, but without the challenge of VR where it's like performance versus being able to actually read the instruments. Um, which is a whole nother thing about VR flight sim challenges. But um, yeah, that, that kind of one-to-one, -one, I'm just moving my body the way I normally do, and it's reacting in a way that's useful to me. It's really powerful. Jimmy, do you know, does the um, that kind of Xbox classic yeah. one, does that uh, allow speech to text as well? Because I know um, there's a lot of people that use, you know, will want to use speech commands of like, you know, duck, shoot, uh, things like the... that. Sadly not. The XAC, it supports, um, actually, it's just had a software update to support more USB devices. So you can plug in big USB thumbsticks, for example, that are, you know, like a flight sim stick and use it as a thumbstick. But it's purely it's purely mechanical, physical input. Um, I don't think it has a microphone on it. Um, yeah, I, I did see a thing about um, Copilot being used. Uh, so Microsoft's just done a new version of Copilot, the AI, rather than Copilot, the... BBC, uh, the Xbox feature for two users using the same controller, and one of the one of their examples was it was game accessibility. It was asking for how to do so, how to do some task in, in Minecraft. That was a very cool um, example. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I'd love to see something that can support all those different things of of mm -hmm. yeah, like speech to text and so on uh, at the same time. But I think a lot of these will have to rely on the hardware developers. 
Uh, well, we are just about close to the hour. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for coming out. Pierce, did you have any any final words for us here? No, that was great. Special thanks to uh, Mar, Rick, and uh, Jamie. Appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. And if anybody has, um, you know, things you find uh, that can support different things, we we're definitely saving the chat here, and we'll be putting that uh, on the event page. Um, and if anybody comes up with other things that you'd like to add here, or you'd like us to add to the uh, the XR Access and XR Association uh, GitHub, which I'm posting the link again, we're, we do keep that as the kind of open source library of uh, all the different tools that we found. Um, please send it to us. You can email me at uh, info at xraxcess.org. Um, and uh, in any case, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.